Thank you so much, Jeff. And uh, I want to start by saying thank you very much to Chief Cragen and the Seashell Band for welcoming us here today. And thank you all for coming. So yes, Lynn and the, the Salish Sea Coal Committee have asked me to give a bit of context and a big picture. So I, I am taking this on as a bit of a storytelling exercise. So I'm kind of just going to babble at you for a while until the hook comes out. Um, and go through a few websites that will help, I think, illustrate the story. I hope. So I'm going to start with an aside, which is probably the worst possible thing to do when you're speaking publicly. But the aside is this uh, map is on a website called Coal Export Stories, built for us by the amazing Owen Moriarty, who's in the back of the room, um, our videographer for the, for the movement. Um, where we are asking folks to uh, submit statements that are then mapped along the route, the coal export route, all the way from the mines in Wyoming and Mont Montana through to export terminals here in BC. So oh, the, all those dots you see on the map are actually videos or written statements from folks who, who live along that, that route. Um, but the map is really to just sort of illustrate to you where is this coal coming from? Why are, why are we faced with these proposals and this problem? Um, so starting about in 2010, 2011, big coal companies that are mining in the Powder River Basin in Wyoming and Montana in the US um, started to make plans to export their dirty, dusty, volatile product to Asian markets. Why? Because they're getting desperate. Um, they've always been able to sell to the domestic market to fuel coal-fired power plants in the U.S. Well, the U.S. finally started to shape up a bit, is trying to transition off of coal, is shutting down polluting power plants, and that means their domestic market is drying up. So they're desperate to, instead of saying to themselves as an industry, maybe we should look at the, the future of doom for our product and start investing in something new, something that will take us into the future, they're trying to keep the industry on life support by exporting that product to uh, China, Korea, Japan. Um, so the problem with that plan is that the only place on the west coast of North America that actually exports coal is BC. So, and we export, we have for decades, we've export our own metallurgical coal for steel making. Um, but it's the only place that this Powder River Basin thermal coal has been able to sneak a leg into the export market at West Shore Terminals and Delta. Because there was an existing coal terminal, they started buying up extra capacity with n really no input at all or even notice to the public except that people in Surrey, White Rock, and Delta started seeing coal trains coming through their cities. That was pub public notice. Um, so coal companies started uh, joining together to propose bigger terminals all up and down the west coast of, of Washington and Oregon and here in BC um, because there is such small capacity and no existing coal export terminals in Washington and Oregon. Um, but residents and com community leaders said, no way, this is not, we're not going to stand for this. This is not the kind of region we are, it's not the future we want, um, and came together in a pretty powerful coalition called Power Past Coal. Um, so as you can sort of see here, Power Past Coal is an ever-growing alliance of health, environmental businesses, clean energy, faith, and community groups working to stop coal export off the West Coast. Um, so in the face of this widespread opposition and the pretty sophisticated campaign that Power Past Coal has, has mounted, out of seven proposals for new export terminals, three have been withdrawn in Washington and Oregon. One, uh, a fourth proposal was rejected in May of this year by the state of Oregon, uh, which denied a permit for a proposed terminal on the, on the Columbia River, um, effectively killing the project. And the two remaining proposals for large-scale coal export terminals in Washington are now plodding their way through a very slow environmental assessment process, um, which is required by federal and state law in the United States. 
and uh, will include health impact assessments and is shaped at every, every step of the way by public input. Um, so that leaves one proposal, the one that we're facing here, the Fraser Surrey Docks Texada Island transshipment proposal. Um, and from early on in their campaign, Power Pass Coal heard pushback from the industry that, listen, if you don't want to build these terminals, if you don't want to export coal, we'll just take it to BC. They're happy to ship coal, and they'll get all the jobs that you're miss missing out on. So the Power Pass Coal realized we're going to need to build some partnerships with folks in BC. Um, so that's kind of where Dogwood came into the picture. Because at about the same time, 2011, um, Dogwood and other groups here in BC were starting to look at this issue of coal exports and expansion. Um, and back in 2011, Dogwood put together this report. Oh, you can't really see what it says. That is, anyway. It's a report that you can look up online called BC's Dirty Secret. It was the first place that really we added up the sum of the vast and terrifying sum of coal export expansion that could happen if all the proposed new mines went through, if all the proposed export terminal expansions went through. Um, and so from that, I would say voters taking action on climate change really got into the vanguard of this movement by running with that issue and really pulling it out of the shadows and making coal export expansion an issue, an issue of concern here in BC. Um, and that's about the time Power Pass Coal reached out to find a, a Canadian partner and Dogwood came on board in late 2012. They brought me on in 2013 and I jumped into a, a huge groundswell of, of community-based opposition and a people-powered movement that had already taken, taken, I don't know, what's the right metaphor? Anyway, <laughs> but thanks to the efforts of, of voters taking action of, on climate change, all those little fires had really grown into um, the birth of a movement um, in, uh, in opposition to this expansion of coal exports in BC. Um, now, because of our pathetic environmental laws, which Anna is going to talk to us about later, um, and the wildly undemocratic nature of decision making around coal exports in BC, the, at first the Fraser Surrey Texada pro project was really seen as a shoe in. Um, it was the easiest, quickest route for Powder River Basin coal to get to market. And we saw business as usual with an earlier proposal at Neptune terminals to expand their, their facilities there. Um, now, the, the decision maker on these is Port Metro Vancouver, which is a federal port authority that oversees port terminals in, in the Lower Mainland. Um, so when the Neptune Terminal expansion came up, VTAC, other local community groups, um, got wind of it. There was hardly even public notice. Got wind, started raising concerns, including concerns from our chief medical health officers with, at Fraser and Vancouver Coastal Health Authorities. The, the port got a flood of letters in December of 2012, and in the first week of January, rubber stamped the project, approved it, and called the public input it had gotten just a bunch of form letters. So this is what we thought we could expect with the Fraser Surrey Docks project as well, um, and, and probably would have gotten the same treatment, a rubber stamp, had it not been for the amazing groundwork that had already occurred, thanks to voters taking action on climate change, other community groups, and that groundswell of opposition. And I would say outrage in the face of that, what had happened with the Neptune project. Um, we, weren't just, we were not gonna stand for that again. And that's kind of where I came in. So it's been an amazing year and a half, um, and I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about what's, a little bit of an overview about what's happened since then. There's tons of stuff I'm going to leave out, so my apologies ahead of time. So even this is a little outdated now, which I apologize, but that's actually good news. Um, when, what Dogwood Initiative really tried to bring to this people-powered movement was our ability to build and mobilize a large and ever-growing uh, base, province-wide base of supporters, and uh, 
and mobilize those folks at key decision-making points and help sort of knit together this amazing coalition of groups working in BC with the coalition of groups working in the United States and be that, that link. Um, so to date, we now have 30, over 33,000 signatures on our Beyond Coal petition. And taken together with other petition signatures from groups like Communities in Coal, that's more than 46,000 British Columbians who are, are now concerned and opposed uh, about this, this proposal to expand US thermal coal exports. So thanks to that citizen effort, starting with New Westminster, we sort of, it sort of sparked a wave of municipal and regional government resolutions, um, either calling for health and environmental impact assessments or just opposing this Fraser Suridox Texada Island project outright. Um, we're now up to 14 of those resolutions, plus the amazing victory that Lynn mentioned uh, at the Union of BC Municipalities in September, which was largely thanks to the leadership of um, Sunshine Coast Regional District Director Donna Sugar. Is Donna here? Yes. Thank you, Donna. Um, and uh, six school boards have also passed resolutions. Uh, this, I, this sort of paralleled what I kind of call the era of community forums, where uh, just all across southern BC, uh, communities came together to hold forums just like this. That happened a year ago here in this hall. Um, to inform themselves and, and start taking action. Um, and it resulted in the formation of new groups like the Salish Sea Coal Committee, um, the Amazing Communities in Coal, which is working out of South Surrey and White Rock. Um, and then we, we saw continued leadership from the chief medical officers of Fra Fraser and Vancouver Coastal Health Authorities, um, which really strengthened the, the, the movement in a huge way, I would say, um, when they called for a a full, comprehensive, independent health impact assessment covering the whole scope of this bizarre transshipment project that goes, you know, comes from the U.S. border all the way to Texida Island and out to sea. Um, and so many organizations, community groups, environmental groups, four unions, including the teachers and the nurses, have come on board. Um, neighborhood associations, you name it, have lent, the, lent their support in the last couple of years. So this is a, a powerful force, um, and it, it, it added up. It forced Port Metro Vancouver, who's sort of the senior decision maker on this project, to delay the project and to amend the way that it, it went through the approval process. Now, unfortunately, the responses every time have been wholly inadequate. Um, so for example, we demanded public hearings on the project. Uh, Instead, they got Fraser Surrey Docks to hold a couple of open houses in Surrey, Surrey only. Um, we, the port, we asked for a health impact assessment, of course. The port asked the company to do an environmental impact assessment, um, which it made up the rules for as it went along because it did not trigger the, the federal or provincial environmental assessment acts. Um, on that assessment, more than 4,000 people submitted comments does anyone want to guess how many of those comments were in favor of the proposal? Six. Six. Like less than 1%. Uh, did that mean that they went back and did a health impact assessment or just scrapped the project entirely? No. No. They asked for a little more health data, didn't give anybody the data before they made the decision, and then approved the permit in August. So meanwhile, uh, the port wasn't the only agency that has some say over this project. Obviously, it needs the Texada portion, and that's under provincial jurisdiction. You all know quite a bit about this. This is many of you having tried to engage in the lack of process that there was around that permit um, for the Texada facility. Again, um, folks mostly got the runaround from the province. Donald's going to tell us a little bit more about this um, and give us an update on the latest there. But once again, the province um, gave, gave us the runaround and responded, not our jurisdiction, pointed us back to the port. So what's left? The project now um, needs, two, needs to get two major permits from Metro Vancouver, which is our regional district in the lower mainland, an air quality permit and a wastewater discharge permit. Now the good news about 
our regional government is, of course, it's run by elected officials. Imagine that, who might actually be accountable and might actually hold a public comment process that might actually matter in the final decision. And so we're looking to that process as sort of the last battleground to stop Fraser Sturydock's Texeda in its, in its tracks. Um, so the fight is far from over. Um, we're, we're looking towards Metro next, which is why in the last uh, several m weeks, Dogwood Initiative has been focusing quite a bit on the upcoming municipal elections, because that will have a big impact on, not only are we seeing amazing local leadership at that level, but in Metro Vancouver, that'll have a big impact on the outcome of that final permit process. So I'm just gonna leave you with one more website. And this is like the worst possible thing you can do is have a mixed message with like five different websites. But I'll leave you with one more website at the end. localvote2014.org, where you can input your postal code and it'll come up with candidate survey responses from your municipality. We asked candidates to answer questions on their position on oil and coal exports and local democracy issues, how much we should have a say over these projects. Um, and you can see their responses on this website. And most importantly, get out and vote. So, Thank you for, uh, for letting me babble at you for a while. I hope that was a bit of a big picture.